Biosequestration is the capture and storage of the atmospheric greenhouse gas carbon dioxide by biological processes. This may be by increased photosynthesis through practices such as reforestation, preventing deforestation and genetic engineering, by enhanced soil carbon trapping in agriculture, or by the use of algal biosequestration to absorb the carbon dioxide emissions from coal, petroleum oil, or natural gas-fired electricity generation. Biosequestration as a natural process has occurred in the past, and was responsible for the formation of the extensive coal and oil deposits which are now being burned. It is a key policy concept in the climate change mitigation debate. It does not generally refer to the sequestering of carbon dioxide in oceans see carbon sequestration and ocean acidification or rock formations, depleted oil or gas reservoirs see oil depletion and peak oil, deep saline aquifers, or deep coal seams see coal mining for all sea geosequestration or through the use of industrial chemical carbon dioxide scrubbing. The importance of plants in storing atmospheric carbon dioxide After water vapor, concentrations of which humans have limited capacity to influence carbon dioxide is the most abundant and stable greenhouse gas in the atmosphere methane rapidly reacts to form water vapor and carbon dioxide. Atmospheric carbon dioxide has increased from about 280 ppm in 1750 to 383 ppm in 2007 and is increasing at an average rate of 2 ppm per year. The world's oceans have previously played an important role in sequestering atmospheric carbon dioxide through solubility and the action of phytoplankton. This, and the likely adverse consequences for humans and the biosphere of associated global warming, increases the significance of investigating policy mechanisms for encouraging biosequestration. <laughs> Reforestation, avoided deforestation and LULUCF The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change IPCC estimates that the cutting down of forests is now contributing close to 20% of the overall greenhouse gases entering the atmosphere. Kandel and Raupik argue that there are four primary ways in which reforestation and reducing deforestation can increase biosequestration. First, by increasing the volume of existing forest. Second, by increasing the carbon density of existing forests at a stand and landscape scale. Third, by expanding the use of forest products that will sustainably replace fossil fuel emissions. Fourth, by reducing carbon emissions that are caused from deforestation and degradation. Land clearing reductions, the majority of the time, create biodiversity benefits in a vast expanse of land regions. Concerns, however, arise when the density and area of vegetation increases the grazing pressure could also increase in other areas, causing land degradation. A recent report by the Australian CSIRO found that forestry and forest-related options are the most significant and most easily achieved carbon sink making up 105 mount per year CO2e or about 75% of the total figure attainable for the Australian state of Queensland from 2010 to 2050. 
Among the forestry options, the CSIRO report announced, forestry with the primary aim of carbon storage called carbon forestry has the highest attainable carbon storage capacity 77 mount CO2e per year while strategy balanced with biodiversity plantings can return 7 to 12 times more native vegetation for a 10% to 30% reduction of carbon storage performance. Legal strategies to encourage this form of biosequestration include permanent protection of forests in national parks or on the World Heritage List, properly funded management and bans on use of rainforest timbers and inefficient uses such as woodchipping old growth forest. As a result of lobbying by the Developing Country Caucus or Group of 77 in the United Nations associated with the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development in Rio de Janeiro, the non-legally binding forest principles were established in 1992. These linked the problem of deforestation to third world debt and inadequate technology transfer and stated that the Agreed full incremental cost of achieving benefits associated with forest conservation should be equitably shared by the international community. Para 1 b. Subsequently, the Group of 77 argued in the 1995 Intergovernmental Panel on Forests IPF and then the 2001 Intergovernmental Forum on Forests IFF, for affordable access to environmentally sound technologies without the stringency of intellectual property rights, while developed states there rejected demands for a forests fund. The expert group created under the United Nations Forum on Forests UNFF reported in 2004, but in 2007 developed nations again vetoed language in the principles of the final text which might confirm their legal responsibility under international law to supply finance and environmentally sound technologies to the developing world. In December 2007, after a two-year debate on a proposal from Papua New Guinea and Costa Rica, state parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change FCCC agreed to explore ways of reducing emissions from deforestation and to enhance forest carbon stocks in developing nations. The underlying idea is that developing nations should be financially compensated if they succeed in reducing their levels of deforestation through valuing the carbon that is stored in forests, a concept termed avoided deforestation AD or red if broadened to include reducing forest degradation see reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. Under the free market model advocated by the countries who have formed the coalition of rainforest nations, developing nations with rainforests would sell carbon sink credits under a free market system to Kyoto Protocol Annex I states who have exceeded their emissions allowance. Brazil, the state with the largest area of tropical rainforest, however, opposes including avoided deforestation in a carbon trading mechanism and instead favors creation of a multilateral development assistance fund created from donations by developed states. For RED to be successful science and regulatory infrastructure related to forests will need to increase so nations may inventory all their forest carbon, show that they can control land use at the local level and prove that their emissions are declining. Subsequent to the initial donor nation response, the UN established RED Plus, or RED Plus, expanding the original program's scope to include increasing forest 
forest cover through both reforestation and the planting of new forest cover, as well as promoting sustainable forest resource management. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change UNFCCC Article 4 1 a requires all parties to develop, periodically update, publish and make available to the Conference of the Parties", as well as, "...national inventories of anthropogenic emissions by sources", "...removals by sinks of all greenhouse gases not controlled by the Montreal Protocol." Under the UNFCCC reporting guidelines, human-induced greenhouse emissions must be reported in six sectors, energy including stationary energy and transport, industrial processes, solvent and other product use, agriculture, waste, and land use, land use change and forestry the rules governing accounting and reporting of greenhouse gas emissions from LULUCF under the Kyoto Protocol are contained in several decisions of the Conference of Parties under the UNFCCC and LULUCF has been the subject of two major reports by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change IPCC. The Kyoto Protocol Article 3.3 thus requires mandatory LULUCF accounting for afforestation no forest for last 50 years, reforestation no forest on 31 December 1989 and deforestation, as well as in the first commitment period under Article 3.4 voluntary accounting for cropland management, grazing land management management, revegetation and forest management if not already accounted under Article 3.3 as an example, the Australian National Greenhouse Gas Inventory NGGI, prepared in compliance with these requirements indicates that the energy sector accounts for 69% of Australia's emissions, agriculture 16% and LULUCF 6%. Since 1990, however, emissions from the energy sector have increased 35%, stationary energy up 43% and transport up 23%. By comparison, emissions from LULUCF have fallen by 73%. However, questions have been raised by Andrew McIntosh about the veracity of the estimates of emissions from the LULUCF sector because of discrepancies between the Australian Federal and Queensland Government's land clearing data. Data published by the Statewide Land Cover and Trees Study SLATS in Queensland, for example, show that the total amount of land clearing in Queensland identified under SLATS between 1989-90 and 2001 is approximately 50% higher than the amount estimated by the Australian Federal Government's National Carbon Accounting System NCAS between 19 and 2001, satellite imaging has become crucial in obtaining data on levels of deforestation and reforestation. Landsat satellite data, for example, has been used to map tropical deforestation as part of NASA's Landsat Pathfinder Humid Tropical Deforestation Project, a collaborative effort among scientists from the University of Maryland, the University of New Hampshire, and NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. The project yielded deforestation maps for the Amazon Basin, Central Africa, and Southeast Asia for three periods in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. <laughs> Enhanced photosynthesis 
Biosequestration may be enhanced by improving photosynthetic efficiency by modifying Rubisco genes in plants to increase the catalytic and or oxygenation activity of that enzyme. One such research area involves increasing the Earth's proportion of C4 carbon fixation photosynthetic plants. C4 plants represent about 5% of Earth's plant biomass and 1% of its known plant species, but account for around 30% of terrestrial carbon fixation. In leaves of C3 plants, captured photons of solar energy undergo photosynthesis which assimilates carbon into carbohydrates in the chloroplasts of the mesophyll cells. The primary CO2 fixation step is catalyzed by ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate carboxylase, oxygenase Rubisco, which reacts with O2 leading to photorespiration that protects photosynthesis from photoinhibition but wastes 50% of potentially fixed carbon. The C4 photosynthetic pathway, however, concentrates CO2 at the site of the reaction of Rubisco, thereby reducing the biosequestration inhibiting photorespiration. A new frontier in crop science consists of attempts to genetically engineer C3 staple food crops such as wheat, barley, soybeans, potatoes and rice with the turbo-charged photosynthetic apparatus of C4 plants. <inaudible> Biochar Biochar charcoal created by pyrolysis of biomass is a potent form of long-term, thousands of years biosequestration of atmospheric CO2 derived from investigation of the extremely fertile terra preta soils of the Amazon basin. Placing biochar in soils also improves water quality, increases soil fertility, raises agricultural productivity and reduce pressure on old growth forests. As a method of generating bioenergy with carbon storage Rob Flanagan and the EPRIDA Biochar Company have developed low-tech cooking stoves for developing nations that can burn agricultural wastes such as rice husks and produce 15% by weight of biochar, while Best Energies in NSW Australia have spent a decade developing an agriculture technology that can combust 90 96 tons of dry biomass each day, generating 30 to 40 tons of biochar. A parametric study of biosequestration by Malcolm Fowles at the Open University, indicated that to mitigate global warming, policies should encourage displacement of coal with biomass as a power source for baseload electricity generation if the latter's conversion efficiency rose over 30%, otherwise biosequestering carbon from biomass as a cheaper mitigation option than geosequestration by CO2 capture and storage. Topic: <inaudible> Improved agricultural and farming practices. Zero till farming practices occur where there is much mulching but plowing is not used, so that the carbon rich organic matter in soil is not exposed to atmospheric oxygen, or to the leaching and erosion effects of rainfall. Ceasing plowing has been alleged to encourage more ants to become predators of wood eating and CO2 generating termites, allows weeds to regenerate soils and helps slow water flows over the land. Soil holds more carbon than vegetation and atmosphere combined, and in the USA most soil lies under grazing land. Holistic planned grazing holds tremendous potential in mitigating global warming, while building soil, increasing biodiversity, and reversing desertification. 
Developed by Alan Savory, it uses fencing and or herders, to restore grasslands by carefully planning movements of large herds of livestock to mimic the vast herds found in nature where grazing animals are kept concentrated by pack predators and forced to move on after eating, trampling, and manuring an area, returning only after it has fully recovered. This method of grazing seeks to emulate what occurred during the past 40 million years as the expansion of grass grazer ecosystems built deep, rich grassland soils, sequestering carbon and cooling the planet. Dedicated biofuel and biosequestration crops, such as switchgrass Panicum virgatum, are also being developed. It requires from 0.97 to 1.34 GJ fossil energy to produce one ton of switchgrass, compared with 1.99 to 2.66 GJ to produce one ton of corn. Given that switchgrass contains approximately 18.8 GJ, ODT of biomass, the energy output to input ratio for the crop can be up to 20 to 1. Biosequestration can also be enhanced by farmers choosing crop species that produce large numbers of phytoliths. Phytoliths are microscopic spherical shells of silicon that can store carbon for thousands of years. <inaudible> Biosequestration and climate change policy Industries with large amounts of CO2 emissions such as the coal industry are interested in biosequestration as a means of offsetting their greenhouse gas production. In Australia, university researchers are engineering algae to produce biofuels hydrogen and biodiesel oils and investigating whether this process can be used to biosequester carbon. Algae naturally capture sunlight and use its energy to split water into hydrogen, oxygen and oil which can be extracted. Such clean energy production also can be coupled with desalination using salt-tolerant marine algae to generate fresh water and electricity. Many new bioenergy biofuel technologies, including cellulosic ethanol biorefineries using stems and branches of most plants including crop residues such as corn stalks, wheat straw and rice straw are being promoted because they have the the added advantage of biosequestration of CO2. The Garnot Climate Change Review recommends that a carbon price in a carbon emission trading scheme could include a financial incentive for biosequestration processes. Garnot recommends the use of algal biosequestration see algae bioreactor to absorb the constant stream of carbon dioxide emissions from coal-fired electricity generation and metal smelting until renewable forms of energy, such as solar and wind power, become more established contributors to the grid. Garnot, for example, states some algal biosequestration processes could absorb emissions from coal-fired electricity generation and metals smelting. The United Nations Collaborative Programme on Reducing Emissions from Deforestation and Forest Degradation in Developing Countries UN Red Program is a collaboration between FAO, UNDP and UNEP under which a trust fund established in July 2008 allows donors to pool resources to generate the requisite transfer flow of resources to significantly reduce global emissions emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. The UK government's stern review on the economics of climate change argued that curbing deforestation was a «highly cost-effective way of reducing greenhouse gas emissions». James E. Hansen argues that 
an effective way to achieve drawdown of carbon dioxide would be to burn biofuels in power plants and capture the CO2, with the biofuels derived from agricultural or urban wastes or grown on degraded lands using little or no fossil fuel inputs. Such CO2 drawdown systems are referred to as bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, or BECCS. According to a study by BioRecro and the Global CCS Institute, there is currently as of January 2012, 550,000 tons CO2 per year in total BECCS capacity operating, divided between three different facilities under a 2009 agreement. Loy Yang Power and MBD Energy Limited will build a pilot fossil fuel power plant at the Latrobe Valley Power Station in Australia using biosequestration technology in the form of an algal synthesizer system. Captured CO2 from the waste exhaust flue gases will be injected into circulating waste water to grow oil-rich algae where sunlight and nutrients will produce heavy oil-laden slurry that can make high-grade oil for energy, or stock feed. Other commercial demonstration projects involving biosequestration of CO2 at point of emission have begun in Australia. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Philosophical basis of biosequestration. The arguments for biosequestration are often shaped in terms of economic theory, yet there is a well-recognized quality of life dimension to this debate. Biosequestration assists human beings to increase their collective and individual contributions to the essential resources of the biosphere. The policy case for biosequestration overlaps with principles of ecology, sustainability and sustainable development, as well as biosphere, biodiversity and ecosystem protection, environmental ethics, climate ethics and natural conservation. Barriers to increased global biosequestration The Garnot Climate Change Review notes many barriers to increased global biosequestration. There must be changes in the accounting regimes for greenhouse gases. Investments are required in research, development and commercialization of superior approaches to biosequestration. Adjustments are required in the regulation of land use. New institutions will need to be developed to coordinate the interests in utilization of biosequestration opportunities across small business in rural communities. Special efforts will be required to unlock potential in rural communities in developing countries. Sadler and King have argued that biosequestration and agricultural greenhouse gas emissions should not be handled within a global emissions trading scheme because of difficulties with measuring such emissions, problems in controlling them and the burden that would be placed on numerous small-scale farming operations. Collett likewise maintains that red credits post facto payments to developing countries for reducing their deforestation rates below an historical or projected reference rate, simply create a complex market approach to this global public health problem that reduces transparency and accountability when targets are not met and will not be as effective as developed nations voluntarily funding countries to keep their 
rainforests. The World Rainforest Movement has argued that poor developing countries could be pressured to accept reforestation projects under the Kyoto Protocol's Clean Development Mechanism in order to earn foreign exchange simply to pay off the interest on debt to the World Bank. Tensions also exist over forest management between the sovereignty claims of nation-states, arguments about common heritage of mankind and the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities, the Forest Peoples Program FPP, arguing the anti-deforestation programs could merely allow financial benefits to flow to national treasuries, privilege would be corporate forest degraders who manipulate the system by periodically threatening forests, rather than local communities who conserve them. The success of such projects will also depend on the accuracy of the baseline data and the number of countries involved. Further, it has been argued that if biosequestration is to play a significant role in mitigating anthropogenic climate change then coordinated policies should set a goal of achieving global forest cover to its extent prior to the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s. It has also been argued that the United Nations mechanism for reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation red, may increase pressure to convert or modify other ecosystems, especially savannas and wetlands, for food or biofuel, even though those ecosystems also have high carbon sequestration potential. Globally, for example, peatlands cover only 3% of the land surface but store twice the amount of carbon as all the world's forests, whilst mangrove forests and salt marshes are examples of relatively low biomass ecosystems with high levels of productivity and carbon sequestration. Other researchers have argued that RED is a critical component of an effective global biosequestration strategy that could provide significant benefits, such as the conservation of biodiversity, particularly if it moves away from focusing on protecting forests that are most cost-effective for reducing carbon emissions such as those in Brazil where agricultural opportunity costs are relatively low. Unlike Asia, which has sizable revenues from oil palm, rubber, rice, and maize. They argue RED could be varied to allow funding of programs to slow peat degradation in Indonesia and target protection of biodiversity in hot spot areas with high species richness and relatively little remaining forest. Some purchasers, they maintain, of red carbon credits, such as multinational corporations or nations, might pay a premium to save imperiled ecosystems or areas with high-profile species. See also Azola event Bioenergy with carbon capture and storage Carbon cycle Carbon dioxide removal Carbon negative Fossil fuel power station Greenhouse gas remediation Negative emissions Soil carbon <laughs>